Okay, it's five past five. Welcome everyone uh, to this closing event of uh, Kelly Anderson's exhibition Abracadabra, uh, Letter from Technology. I'm Camilo Otero, Artist Programs Manager at Center for Book Arts. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge CBA is on the ancestral unceded territory of the Lenny Lenape people. This event is being live streamed to our YouTube channel and will be available on the platform afterwards. If you don't wish to appear, please keep your cameras off and keep yourself muted during the event. Abracadabra Letter Form Technology invites visitors into playful dialogue with mysterious dimensions of typographic symbology, technology, and their own perception. The exhibition aims to break down barriers between artists and audience, constructing a democratic space for all visitors to participate in the realization and ownership of the work. It does so by presenting takeaway interactive elements, pamphlets, prompts to create letter forms and collaborative thought experiments. Kelly Anderson is an artist, designer, animator, and tinkerer who pushes the limits of ordinary materials to seek out possibilities hidden in plain view in humble materials. Her books and projects have included a pop-up paper planetarium, a book that transforms into a pinhole camera, a working paper record, and techniques for misusing Rezo to create tactile, inky animations. Intentionally lo-fi, she believes that humble materials can provide entry into the endless tunneling complexity of our world, making those wonders accessible on a multi-sensory, rich human level. By opening black box concepts up to the poetics of playfulness of the senses, her projects function as a lab space for collaboration, thereby broadening accessibility and the diversity of voices at the table. She is currently completing Alphabet in Motion, an interactive book on the relationship between typography and technology with Letterform Archive. Welcome, Kelly. Thank you so much, Camillo. That was a great introduction. <laughs> Okay, um, sorry everyone uh, who came in person that I cannot be there in person. I was really looking forward to this, but I would probably sneeze on you and then you would never forgive me. <laughs> so here we go. Um, here's a presentation over Zoom. Um, I am uh, 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 hoping, encouraging like everyone who's there in person to like thoroughly explore the installation, take the takeaway packets. Um, we have an additional gift that is being dropped off right now <laughs> for in real life participants that'll help you like get further into some of the topics I'm going to discuss. Um, and then I guess the last thing is um, as I'm going through the presentation, or as you're going through the installation, think of questions. Like I love Q&A and this is, I mean, when you're talking about like the history of letter forms, you're talking about the history of type, you're kind of talking about like the whole history of human civilization. And so there are, um, even though the show, uh, I know to us and uh, to everyone at the Center of Book, Art or Book Arts, like, you know, we definitely put on like a very ambitious installation and exhibition, but it just barely scratches the surface of, um, you know, everything there is to know about like letter forms and writing and typography and technology. So um, without further ado, I'm going to jump into my slideshow here. All right. Okay, um, so this is the name of the exhibition, uh, Abracadabra, Letter Form Technology. This is sadly the last day. It's so sad. Um, months and months ago when we were hatching the idea for the show, um, I came up with this invitation. Um, so these are 
parts of letter forms um, that are printed, Rizzo printed on, on glassine uh, sheets. And then they come with a watermarked, here, let me just, they come with a uh, watermarked second layer that if you hold it up to the light, they join together. Um, and it's just kind of like, we made this as sort of a reminder of like how strange it is that these shapes signify anything at all. When you break them apart, you know, they're just a collection of straight line, curved lines, um, all of these different shapes. And so um, part of what we were trying to do with this invitation was to get people thinking criti critically about like just how magic it is that these shapes can um, make every letter we know, can make every sentence we know, can make every, you know, thought that's ever been expressed in writing by, uh, human beings in the, the, uh, the Western, um, world. Um, so when you arrive at the show, you will be greeted with this introduction, um, and an introductory packet that is on the wall. Um, and then the installation is, it's full of a lot of toys, really. So there are a lot of like interactive gadgets um, that are hopefully addictive and fun to play with uh, that are physical metaphors for these ideas that are important to the history of typography um, and help explain how the technology um, brought us these letter forms and how the technology affected these letter form shapes. Um, so this is kind of like kind of an academic topic, kind of a nerdy topic. Um, but, you know, hopefully, um, you know, uh, people, visitors of all levels, whether you are in fifth grade or whether you have a uh, master's degree in the topic of uh, typography, like, you know, hopefully there's, there's something here that will be of interest to you and deepen your, your understanding of these topics. Um, so this is the opening. This is part of the reason why I was like, oh, I have a cold. I should stay home. <laughs> it's just because it was so packed last time um, that I can't imagine getting getting all of you lovely people sick. Um, so the point of the show, um, besides trying to get people into these nerdy topics that I'm very interested in, is to demonstrate like how the zeitgeist, how philosophy and how overarching cultural modes um, get expressed in this microscopic form in typography and in type design. Um, so this uh, image that I'm showing here with the the ho, ho, ho. Um, so this is uh, an image, an illustration from Aldo um, Novorossi's book. And what he's doing here is, you know, showing the stylistic similarities uh, between like Romanesque architecture um, and the typography that emerged from that period, from Gothic architecture and from uh, the black letter lettering um, of that period. Um, and then some super mod, super 60s, super ellipses um, that also showed up in the typography. So um, it, is this, I can't remember who, I think it was Aldo Navarasi. It might've been, it might've been someone else who said that typography is generally like 10 years behind the style in these other things because creating a typeface just requires like so much work and so much um, attention to detail, um, but definitely like captures this, the spirit of the BU that it comes from. Um, and part of the reason why I called the show Abracadabra is because I feel like it is truly a miracle of our own perception that we're able to, you know, glance at these different styles, you know, tiny little shapes printed on a page and get transported to these completely er different eras of human civilization and like how does that work um and to begin explaining that and begin ex to think about that um i have a quote from uh garrett nortzi here and he says you know typography is a good model for observing perfect perception because you know with its strict rules it creates an artificial laboratory-like workspace that everyone has within their reach 
um, the relationship between shape and counter shape, which in writing amounts to the relationship between black and white, light and dark, is the foundation of perception. The interpretation from any sense organ relies on this principle of contrast. Um, so, you know, you have like a lot of artists who work at this very, very large scale. I'm thinking of like um, James Wheeler or um, or Doug Wheeler or James Terrell, these light and space artists who are really interested in you know, breaking down the fourth wall and getting an audience really interested in the mechanics of how their own perception work. But I feel like typography is sort of like this humble, small, miniature scale uh, way to play with your perception and investigate your perception. Um, so the show, as you'll see, is organized into four parts, um, and they correlate to four different essays, which you can get out of these boxes. Um, the first one is examining letter forms as parts. Um, so it goes into the history of movable type, you know, using moving around parts of letters in lead to create sentences that can then be printed, create sentences within paragraphs, within pages, within books. Um, but a further one further level, level of atomization down is the um, is modular type, which uh, takes all of these different parts that make up a letter form um, and allow you to rearrange it. Um, so have some cool modular alphabets there to play with. Um, just to the right is, is a letter form a structure? So, you know, these shapes that we identify as letters, if they were different shapes, could we still identify them? Um, or are they defined by their structure? And this may seem like, I don't know, like a, like a strange question that might not have any like bearing in reality, but actually um, it was very significant at the dawn of digital type when digital typographers were trying to figure out like how type should in letter form should work on computers. Um, and so, and it, it goes, you know, grab one of these pamphlets. I, I think it's perhaps the most fascinating one. It goes down in all of these different corridors of like, AI and the differences between how human beings think and how computers think. Um, it talks about CAPTCHAs. It goes all over the place. So that one's um, a super fun one. Right to the right of that, uh, there is a section on photo typesetting, which is typesetting with light. So, you know, before photo typesetting, type was set with heavy stuff like lead and blocks of wood, and then comes along photo typesetting. Um, it appeared uh, sort of concurrently with the psychedelic era where there was a lot of interest in light projection and warping um, and led to a lot of different types of experimentation in type design, both because of that warping and because it's a lot easier to, you know, replicate uh, a typeface who, that is on a strip of, for, of film rather than, you know, design and replicate a typeface that is made in lead. That process moves a lot slower. And then the last section, which is the whole glowing wall on the left-hand side, uh, is all about typography and screens. Like how do you get these shapes that are these continuous curves, diagonal lines, and atomize them into a grid? Like what is that process like? What do you lose? You know, What are some interesting things that happen with the technology along the way? Um, so check that out. Um, a secondary thing that you can grab if you're at the exhibit, um, so sort of lower, um, I guess at like, you know, uh, probably, I guess like uh, mid-level, are these little rolls of tape, which dispense information um, about these different typefaces that appeared on lots of records uh, in different time periods. So um, I'm setting up a hypothetical record store organized by typeface. And so this is one, this is over on the, the digital wall, the screens wall, this is countdown. Um, and it's a typeface, which, you know, really conjures up and looks like, you know, uh, early transitional digital type. Um, lend some of its look from MICR type, which was used on like early, like, you know, uh, credit card and like checks and bank processing stuff. Um, it's also been used on a whole lot of albums. <laughs> so um, if you take 
one of these little pieces of tape from the dispenser, then it tells you a little bit about the history of its typeface, like what its aesthetic influences are, and then shows you like just like the wide variety of albums that this typeface has appeared um, upon. Um, an interesting one, the one in the photo type setting um, section is Amelia, which you might recognize from Yellow Submarine, but was pretty much on almost every album in like the 60s and early 70s. It's really incredible. Um, and then the other one, which is uh, in the is a letter of structure section is called Meander. And it really like pushes the limit of legibility. So as you can imagine, this one hasn't been used on a whole lot of albums because most musicians want you to be able to read the band name <laughs> and the album name. Um, but uh, it is a really beautiful, really strange typeface. And it's fascinating to me that this is legible, you know, that you can look at these characters and be like, yes, that says M-E-A. Um, it really is like a testament to how fascinating um what a fascinating sponge the human mind is really but you know even this illegible typeface has been used on some albums most notably notably um stereo labs albums so check out that um there's also a playlist for each one of these typefaces so there's a meander playlist which is very short uh, a countdown playlist and an amelia playlist so um check that out uh it's abcmix1.com, abcmix2.com, and abcmix3.com if you're joining online rather than in real life. Um, okay, so some of the things at the show, so I made a, a, a table-sized pixel drawing machine to demonstrate how anti-aliasing aliasing works and um, to let people play around with um, building type. So anti-aliasing, um, is a technology that was introduced to try to preserve the integrity of the shape of letter forms, um, even though these letter forms were being displayed in grid. Um, so you've probably seen this, you've ever zoomed in really close in Photoshop, you can see that like, you know, around the the black pixels that define this little lowercase g, you'll have all of these little feathered pixels. And so this table, it's a whole bunch of polarization filters. Um, and as you turn them, when they start out at zero degrees, they're totally clear. And then when you turn them at 90 degrees, they're totally black. And then, you know, the feathered grayscale in between. Um, I also left out a book by Toshi Omagari uh, that has a lot of really cool 1970s, um, early 80s, like arcade and video game fonts, which were, you know, all done with this like real like economy. Um, most of them are eight by eight pixels. And um, so these typefaces, they had to make every letter of the alphabet, every number with almost no pixel real estate. So there's like no anti-aliasing, no grayscale pixels, um, just straight up pixels. And so if you need, if you're there in person and you want some inspiration on, you know, a variety of letter forms you can make on this little table, then um, consult that book. It's a really good one. Um, this is more experimentation with, um, polarization filters, making letter forms into grids. Um, the wallpaper in this section of the exhibition is all interactive. So you can pick up like one of these screens and put it up against the wallpaper and rotate it and this will happen. Um, and this is sort of like highlighting a point that's made in the essay about how difficult it is to work with grids on top of grids um, and some of the challenges that uh, type designers, especially like early digital type designers face when designing for screens. There's a lot of wild things that can happen when you have a grid overlaying another grid uh, as demonstrated by this wallpaper. Um, above your head on the ceiling, you'll find a letter form generating mobile. Um, and this refers directly back to the design of those invitations where it's all of these little letter form parts. So um, crossbars, bowls, um, you know, the point of the A, um, 
all floating in space. And when you stand at different vantage points around the gallery, you'll see those shapes merge together and hopefully make some um, letters that you can, you can name. And this is what it looks like from the bottom. Um, yeah, so everything in the gallery I built almost. Um, so these like little dispenser boxes for the essays are inspired by uh, those dispensers in the bathroom where you have like paper towels that like zigzag into each other. Um, so, so yeah, I and um, my friend Keegan who works at the arm printed all of the essays for the show and we put them in a machine to fold them, to zigzag fold them. Um, but then, you know, a lot of volunteers and kind people at the Center for Book Arts have been interlacing them so that when you take one, the next one naturally falls out uh, like the bathroom dispenser. <laughs> um, so what I want to do now, hopefully, hopefully you're for in real life people, your gift has arrived by now. I want to take you through one of these essays. Um, and I'm going to take you through the first essay, which is all about modular typography. This is the section called parts. Um, if you grab an essay pamphlet from this box, it's going to tell you a lot of the same things that I'm telling you right now. Um, so the two modular typefaces that are featured heavily in this exhibit um, are combination shrift, which is a modular alphabet system that was created by Joseph Albers and Patrona Grotesque, um, whose author is unknown, but it is a very interesting um, typeface that I want to tell you everything that is known about it. <laughs> Um, so this is combination script, and the way that it's rendered in the gallery um, is represented as these little blocks. And so you can take these little blocks and join them together, you know, try to draw letters, <clears throat> try to draw your name. And um, uh, everyone who's in real life will also be getting a little letter set version of this so that you can scratch those off and bring it home and play with it. Um, and then this is Patrona Grotesque. So the way that Patrona Grotesque <clears throat> is represented in the gallery is um, a series of stencils. And so we have stencils for all of the letter form parts um, and colored pencil. So feel free to draw a really big letter for yourself, bring it home, invent a new letter form. Um, so let's get into what modular type is. So Wood and hot metal printing um, press technologies gave typesetters movable type, where each character is on a different piece of lead. Um, so if you're typesetting a book, then you are going to, you know, put, you know, if, if it starts with on a dark and stormy night, you would find your capital A, your lowercase n, you know, space very, very slow process, but um, you could write anything you wanted to. Um, any word could be typeset this way. Um, so modular type, as I mentioned, takes that same concept um, of movable type, one increment of granularity farther, and it atomizes letter forms into its constituent parts. Um, so just like this idea of, you know, a bit of Legos or any of the world skyscrapers might be built from a standard bin of parts. You know, the idea is that letters could also be constructed from a modular bin of, uh, of parts. So um, these modular alphabet systems take advantage of the fact that similar shapes typically repeat themselves across an alphabet so that, you know, a P um, shares a lot, the top uh, semicircular bowl of an R, you know, and that you can change it by, by drawing, you know, this, uh, this little part. And an E is basically an L, but with these two crossbars added. Um, but of course, and especially if there's any type designers in the audience, I, I have to tell you that that is not the full story, um, that letters don't all necessarily work this way. 
So an enduring feature of um, typography is this ever-present tension um, between the calligraphic and organic and this idea of the bin of parts system. And, you know, that comes from, in part, the fact that the, you know, um, Western uh, alphabet that we have today comes from these two very different traditions. So um, the Latin alphabet used in the Western world consists of elements that evolved over many centuries as two separate systems. Um, so we have um, on the left, we have, you know, the capital letters of the alphabet, which come from um, a Roman tradition. And then on the right-hand side, we have um, the work of scribes, this calligraphic uh, work. Um, so the lowercase letters in the alphabet come from Carolingian miniatures, which are drawn by hand. Um, so, you know, Roman letters made with a chisel into stone um, had a lot of like geometric uh, properties, um, a lot of like straight lines um, versus this like organic calligraphic uh, script that we see that comes directly out of handwriting. Um, here's a here's a, a close up so you can see it even even closer. So um, here's some upper case letters from Roman columns which are made on a chisel from a chisel and these lowercase letters um, which are made with pen. Um, so you know we now have inherited these two dual histories. Um, and so it's like the segmentation of letters into geometric parts that can be mixed and matched, that has always been an aspect of type design. You know, if you ask any type designer about their process, you know, if they're going to turn a letter B that they already have drawn into a letter P, they're always going to start by like removing one of those bowls and seeing how that works. Um, so that always will be an aspect of type design. Um, but so is this like handmade element. Um, so there's a very, very long history of, uh, of type that we're used to looking at and that we, you know, type should have sort of an organic feel to it. Um, and when it doesn't, when it's like too modular, like our eyes notice and it's not as easy to read. Um, so if you cut most typefaces apart, um, which I'm sure many designers have done this, you'll notice that the forms of your, your favorite typefaces glyphs um, are not in fact perfectly modular. Um, but, oops. But letter forms can be shaped so that they behave that way. Um, and that's exactly what Joseph Albers did when he designed combination script um, represented in the blocks in the gallery here. So, you know, Joseph Albers presents this al alphabet like, you know, what if letters were totally modular? Um, and he comes up with the system where, you know, there are just these 10 different shapes. So there are 10 different built building blocks. And out of those 10 different building blocks, you get an entire um, alphabet. And so the design strikes this, you know, pretty careful balance between this minimum of geometric modules and legibility. Um, and it kind of, um, it's, it's an idea, it's a design idea that emphasizes the arrangement of form um, over drawing, over the drawing of form, which is sort of a radical prioritization of the system, um, you know, over the human in type design. These are some of his, his sketches, which are, you know, kind of ironically like sketched out like by hand in pencil in a notebook. Um, and one interpretation of why this is so, which uh, goes just sort of like my art history brain kicking in here, um, is that, you know, combination shrift, like Albert's combination shrift is really typography filtered through this philosophical lens of the Bauhaus. Um, so the Bauhaus were really, uh, artists and designers were really informed by Gestalt psychology, um, which 
highlighted that, you know, um, human, the way that human perception works um, and our vision works is that we prioritize um, certain shapes and simplify certain shapes. Um, hence the cover of this, uh, this Bauhaus uh, book where you have a um, triangle circle and a square. Um, so this is a good example of, I, I think, well, I know that like when I was in art school, we talked about gestalt a whole lot and gestalt psychology, and it's hard to um, really imagine what that means without an example. And so I want to put forth this example. So um, this is an illusion where, you know, most people, when they look at this, would describe this illusion as being a big triangle, like there's a big black triangle in the middle of the screen, um, which is ironic because there is no big black triangle there, right? Like we have three Pac-Man shapes there. Um, so why is it that our eyes prioritize this non-existent triangle over the Pac-Man shapes that are really there? Um, and Gestalt psychology um, provides an explanation for that. Um, so it's just an innate tendency of how human perception works that we prioritize certain shapes. Um, you know, we prioritize like certain types of differentiation between shapes. Um, so, you know, the Bauhaus was really interested in this and in much in the way that, that science scientists isolate variables, um, from the confounding noise of constant to locate truths, um, Bauhaus artists and designers sought to strip away a lot of the decorative elements and reduce things down to a system to explore um, these ideas more thoroughly. Um, so, you know, Albers in doing this, like really wanted to decouple design from the idea of the individual, from handwriting, uh, from individual subjectivity, and instead investigated on this like higher order of logic um, to figure out like the universal level of perception. Um, and so, so yeah, this, uh, this modular typeface system comes straight out of that thinking. Um, and there's a really good example of like how the philosophy beliefs, um, the interests of a certain era um, group of people movement um, can directly inform like the aesthetics of a type design. Um, so Albers began developing this typeface in 1923, which was um, the year that he started teaching at the Bauhaus. And it was a project that he worked on with his students um, until uh, the, the uh, basically the Nazis sort of like uh, shut down the school and chased them out. Um, so here's him working with the students. Um, and so he worked with them on this typeface until 1931. And the forms are, um, as he writes, sort of the, uh, the forms arose from the logic of the tools that created them. So um, a ruler and a compass and a grid rather than the logic of the handwriting and gestures of the human hand. Um, and so, you know, Albers is, is known, you know, in his wider work is using systems sort of fastidiously and methodically to, you know, arrange geometry and reveal truths about how humans see the world, truths that are otherwise hidden. Um, for example, like, um, you know, a lot of people are familiar with his, um, his square compositions that really contrast color and show how different, how, um, how color is affected by its relationship to um, surrounding colors. So this is um, the final version of combination script and it's a radical, it's radical in its reduction of what a letter form is. So it uses only three basic parts, you know, so we have, you know, these little circular parts, we have rectangular parts, um, then we have like, you know, rounded rectangles to create all of the letters of the alphabet. Um, and an interesting side effect of this um, is that it sort of broadcasts this pleasingly cohesive morphological rhythm, ryth rhythm. Since all of the shapes are the same and they repeat, um, it has to be harmonious. There's no way for it to be disharmonious. 
Um, so, you know, uh, designers sort of employ the same strategy oftentimes when designing. Um, this is like one of the great enduring legacies of the Bauhaus is that, you know, if you want to create something, but you want it to be harmonious, like use the same shapes um, and then everything will have like sort of like a similar rhythm and proportion. Um, so moving on to this other modular typeface that we know a little bit less about, but is very fun to stencil. Um, so this is Patrona Grotesque, and it was made by a Czech type foundry um, called Slavarna Pisam, which I'm probably mispronouncing. Uh, but they issued this modular um, typeface, which is kind of incredible um, as a system because it becomes all of the characters in both the Latin alphabet and the Cyrillic alphabet. Um, so these few shapes can make any character, um, any glyph in both of those alphabets. Um, so if you're familiar with Cyrillic and you're there in real life right now, I, I challenge you. Um, I've tested it out for all of the Latin characters, but um, you should test it and see if you can generate all of the Cyrillic characters too. So um, the name Patrona Grotesque, Patrona um, can be translated as cartridge, um, which brings up that aesthetic of you know, these letter form parts as being parts in this larger machine um, of letter form um, and letter forms being part of this larger machine of language. Um, so, you know, modularity is definitely a con conceptual framework that's based on this um, idea of the assembly of a larger product from a single repeated module, um, which, you know, aesthetically has like a tie-in with industrialized production. Um, and so, you know, um, even if you think about the city and how we build buildings, um, all industrialized modular um, construction, like, shows its parts, you know, so in, in a way, all of this type of construction bears the imprint of its own deconstruction. Like you can look at um, modern construction and be able to see all of the parts, you know, that one would buy uh, at Home Depot. Um, so these are, these are some examples from Carl Narwat, who um, makes a lot of modular letter forms. I'm a big fan of his work. Um, in fine art, this industrial aesthetic, um, thinking about modular parts <clears throat> as the thing that constructs the world is perhaps best articulated in the philosophy of the minimalist. Um, and um, the minimalists were introduced to a skeptical public at this 1966 primary structures um, exhibition at the Jewish Museum. Um, and speaking of Home Depot, <laughs> Dan Flavin had introduced, had arranged modular pieces of raw building materials, fluorescent light tubes um, from the hardware store um, on the wall and created his light sculptures. And Carl Andre created this, um, what was considered then to be a very audacious piece called Lever, which consisted of a single line of 137 fire bricks placed side by side across the gallery. So people were tripping over this uh, the entire night, apparently, and cursing him. Um, you know, implicit in the module, the Lego brick, the bowl of the bee, or the plywood sheet um, is, you know, kind of a philosophy in and of itself. Um, within all of these things is the path for how the building should proceed. So, you know, contemporary modular furniture like IKEA follows the same logic. Um, so they promise sort of like an easy to assemble pre-fabrication, um, which allows you to, you know, tell if something's going to fit in your room or in the space you have allotted to it. Um, and similarly, this Paterna grotesque specimen um, boasts this competitive advantage over other typeface systems that the exact size of each word can be calculated. So there's never going to be a mistake on your sign um, because everything is like so perfectly honed in to be um, a system. So I think in this in this respect, like this idea of modularity 
Um, how does it relate to creativity? Um, I think it, it represents both a, a restrictive and a freeing influence in production and design. So, you know, it uh, allows, um, it allows you to build whatever you want and it gives you this box of tools to help you along the way. Um, but in a way it like, it's almost like when you go bowling and, um, you know, you have uh, bumpers on, you know, it kind of like, <clears throat> there's a way, clear way that the pieces are supposed to fit together. Um, so in a way it's, it's democratizes production, you know, that it makes things a lot easier and it makes um, building more accessible, but it also kind of like puts you on these guide rails to build in a specific way. Um, so this interesting paradox um, is really a condition of modernity that both the uh, minimalist artists um, think about and write about and make art about um, and a lot of these modular typefaces um, that are coeval uh, also address. So when modularity is thought of as a generative system, you know, it really facilitates playfulness you know, while offloading the burden of, you know, um, having to like go get different parts or think about what to do or whatnot. Um, this is great. This is one of my favorite typeface projects. So this is um, Josh Boschew's modular type Rubik's cube. So you can turn this Rubik's cube and <laughs> rearrange the modular parts and form any letter and then stamp it. So it's really pretty brilliant. Um, but, you know, um, modularity also sort of like hems you in into this certain, it prescribes like a way of building. Um, so yeah, you should uh, go off into the gallery, play with these different parts, rearrange these different things, um, grab some of the other essays from the boxes. Um, oh, one more, I didn't, this didn't make it into the show, but another really interesting modular typeface is Super Velos. Um, and this is the Super Velos system. And this was used in Spain. Um, and it was used not only to create every letter form, but <clears throat> people used it and remixed its parts to make like different illustrations. Um, and it was designed by Joan Trocut. Um, if any of you all are familiar with the Brooklyn-based um, artist and illustrator, Alex Trocut, this is his grandfather. Um, and um, there was extensive um, uh, destruction um, in, in, in Spain at this time. And um, it really led to a shortage of metal, um, which is why Super Velos actually had like a lot more um, uh, staying power after the Spanish Civil War than a lot of other typefaces. Um, if you think about it, like it's already like very time consuming to arrange modular type to form a sentence. Um, uh, or movable type to form a sentence. Just imagine like having to combine like even more parts to make every letter that, you know, every part of every letter to make every sentence. Um, so most of these typefaces, however ingenious they were, died away pretty quickly. Um, Super Velos ended up staying around a lot longer because there was such a shortage of metal. Um, and uh, after the Spanish Civil War, um, so yeah, here's like some examples. I'm I'm taking this from uh, Sasha, who runs the Lou Ballin Archive. Um, I saw a talk of his recently, uh, and he talks a lot about Super Velo. So um, if you're interested in this typeface, uh, check out his talk. He is um, one of the type at Cooper Talks, and um, goes on about it for you know a lot longer in longer form than I am. But it's just um, really great. So like all of these illustrations and all of the type here are created out of the Super Velo system.
Um, another really interesting one, and this book is in the, or the specimen, the type specimen is in the letter form archive uh, collection, is Jur uh, Gujarati's negative series. Um, and so this is in a type foundry in India. And don't know a ton about it. Not a ton, ton is known about this specific, specific typeface, but um, it's a system for how all of these um, modular parts on, on these tile letters can be um, fit together to create any letter of the alphabet um, in multiple um, uh, languages. Yeah, so... Um, is this going to play? Yeah, here we go. Uh, so I feel really bad that I am not there in person, which is kind of what we all thought was going to happen today. And so if you're there in person, um, I left you like a little piece of Joseph Albers combination script on letter sets. So you can like play around with it, explore how the system works, make letters. Um, so that's there for you. And yeah, I think that's, I think that's all, all I have for the presentation, but um, I would love to answer questions. Um, so if anyone has any Q&A questions for me, I'm ready. <laughs> Thank you, Kelly. Um, I'm going to try and unmute the computer in the gallery, uh, in the uh, bindery and see if the sound works. If not, I'm just gonna go in and uh, try to like ask you the questions. So I'm unmuting right now. Um, one second. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> I, can hear, I can hear you now. <laughs> uh, does anyone have a question? Okay, we can start with uh, Guido. He's uh, tuning in through Zoom and he's asking, unfortunately, I haven't seen your show, so I can refer to the album's pamphlet. Uh, I can't refer. Uh, would you know if the Doors logo used Super Veloz? <laughs> and if there's anyone who wants to ask you questions that Did that work? I typed in the chat to her, but she's not. Yeah, Kelly. Kelly, can you hear us? Hey, yeah. you're muted. Oh, not anymore. We solved it. Tell us about the doors typeface, though. We didn't hear you. <laughs> Oh, I'm so sorry. I, I don't, it's not a very fulfilling answer. Like I can definitely tell that it is a modular typeface. Like if you look at, you know, half of the semicircle that makes up the O, like it's the same shape that's on the D, but I'm not sure if it's super veloce or not, but it's, it's so few characters. It's hard to tell. It could very well be that. Um, I just did a quick Google search and couldn't find any, any, any historical uh, or, you know, academic sources like like uh, stating that it was, but it's definitely some system. Yeah, it's definitely mo it's definitely modular, some kind of modular type. You might be able to make the Doors logo with um, Albers combination shift too. Uh, so I, I think that those shapes are so basic that they might be like building blocks in like a lot of different you know modular typeface systems. 
I think the S might be the biggest giveaway because the S seems very, the Doors logo S is, you know, has that window pane in the center. So it sounds like you all are having fun in real life and sorry <laughs> <to share. laughs> Are there any um, modular typefaces that are like on non rectangular grids or any like circular hexagonal or anything like that? Um, not that, not that I know of, but that would be really cool. I mean, I guess it depends on like what you define as a, yeah, a modular type. I mean, I'm just thinking like, I, I think traditionally modular typefaces are ones that like take the shape of the letter and break it down. But I'm thinking of even like dot matrix, matrix printers or, you know, I mean, it, it, technically speaking, like all of the arcade game um, typography in Toshi Omagari's book that's out there are made from building blocks of pixels. And so it's modular in a way, like all digital typography is modular in that way, but not in this like, traditional way, but, um, it would be really super fun. Um, one of the things that I tried to do in the gallery was I tried to make a super blobby modular typeface, which are these, like, you can see it. Like when you walk, when you walk into the gallery on the left-hand side, there are sort of these blobby acrylic things that have slots in them and you can slot them together and make like a psychedelic blobby. <laughs> modular typeface. Although I don't think we have gotten any like very convincing letter forms that are super legible. So um, I don't know if you played with that more Camillo and have managed to like make make more reliably uh, legible letters out of those building blocks. <laughs> no, no, uh, it hasn't been that successful, but uh, it's it's definitely fun. Is this some like, is that your design of blobs or because my uh, question was going to be uh have you been like inspired through this research to design like your own modular system yeah yeah so that's my own design but um i carl Nar narwat did something a while ago that is similar similarly blobby um so i've never seen it in person but i saw like some some photos of it but um, I definitely think it would be fun to like, I, I like the idea of something that is, you know, like a system, you know, so it has that, that logic and that geometric order, but then somehow like melts it, you know, like, <laughs> that's kind of like what I was going for is like, I think this is why it's appealing is because like it is, um, it's made up of all of these, these contrasts that shouldn't go together. And so somehow it's, it's pleasing when it does work, but I, I've, I've only made a couple, I made like a B and like a D that looked okay. But like, I think most of the time it just looks like fun, fun chaos. <laughs> um, I also have a question, like when this has been a very like experimental process, because it, it's also linked to that research that you're doing that will eventually uh take the shape of a uh, of a book that you will publish with letter form archive um how do you feel about the you know how the exhibition has worked the times that you've come in and seen people interact um how have you you know like picked up that sort of feedback and information you've been able to re retrieve from seeing people you know like experimenting in the space yeah well I mean I think it's it's gratifying to see people like having fun with things that are typically not considered fun you know like I I think that everyone I know who is in type design there's almost like a a, a gulf between the rest of the world, like non-type designers and type designers. Um, I think Jonathan Huffler put it well in his abstract, if you all see that on Netflix. So he has an episode of abstract 
And he says, you know, it's very annoying to like sit next to people on planes and explain what I do because most of the people just don't even think of letters as being designed, you know, that they're just kind of like part of the environment. They're like too fundamental. Um, and so, you know, the people, the people I know and the friends that I have who are super into type design, you know, it, it's like there's there's these whole histories there. Um, there really is sort of a um, like a like a, a universally interesting angle to all of this, where you can see history shaping these typefaces. You can see um, how type is displayed, you know, affecting history, and yet there's like this barrier that it's hard to get into it because it's like typically such an academic subject or it's such a technical subject that there's not a whole lot of inroads into it. And so, you know, it's, it's a formidable challenge that, you know, we set up for ourselves in creating this exhibition of like, how do we get people to play and, you know, have joyfully interact with these ideas that are like very, at once like persistent through everyday life on every sign and every book, you know, on your screen everywhere, but also invisible, you know, and kind of like remote. And so like, how, how do you change um, people's relationship and how they think and ask questions about something like that is like a real challenge, but um, super fun. Also learned a lot about like, what breaks in a gallery setting because like we were there like all the time fixing things so <laughs> now we now we know a lot about that but uh but yeah it was it seems like people really had a lot of fun like all kinds of people like kids you know academics i know um uh, my friends so i i don't know i feel like we I feel like i'm happy does anyone else have uh, any other question? And your, your question can be like, what's this thing I saw? I don't understand what it is. Like, that's a totally fine question. I'm happy to talk about. How do, uh, like, what's the feedback you've gotten from type designers in the sense uh, that, like, of that playfulness? Do you find that playfulness also in the labor and activity of type designing? Or is this something, like, strange to the, you know, like, to the, to that realm of, you know, design? Yeah, well, I mean... I guess type designers are not like a, a uniform monolithic bunch. That's for sure. Like there's definitely like a lot of debate. There's a lot of different software and there's a lot of different approaches. Um, so, you know, I think, I think that, you know, there are definitely, there are type designers who are working so experimentally that they don't care whether their type is legible or not. And then you have type designers who, optimize obsessively for legibility and like, you know, test out a typeface for many years before it's released. Um, so it kind of runs the spectrum, but, you know, I, I think that there's probably, you know, there, there has to be, I, I think that there has to be some sort of experimentation and joy in anything where when you receive the final product, it seems like it has life in it. Um, so I think, yeah, I think it, it is it is fun, but it probably also very much depends on the designer and what their what their process is. Oh, I just realized I have kind of like a co-host right here. So there. <laughs> He's excited about the show for sure. <laughs> uh, can you talk about your Rezo animation class? Oh yeah. So like as part of, um, uh, I put on the show as part of the faculty, uh, fellows program at CBA. So every year they invite, um, 
like a different uh, artist who works with the book to put on an exhibition and also teach um, some classes. And so um, I I taught a Rizzo animation class. It was called Animating Type on the Rizzo. And we encouraged everyone to bring typographic animations. But um, we went ahead and did that there. And it, uh, it happened over two days. And um, yeah, like basically everyone made animations. I printed them on the Center for Book Arts brand new, beautiful Rizzos. And yeah, you can see you can see the result of that workshop like on my my Instagram page. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Kelly. Um, it was an amazing uh, talk and an amazing show. And I think now everyone can go into the gallery and experiment with your work. Yeah, and I just want to say again that I'm so sorry that I can't be there in person, but I also, you know, thank me for not putting my germs on me. But um, I'm, I'm going to be like very attentive to Instagram. So if you have a question about anything, like DM me, like show me a picture, you know, whatever. Um, and and yeah, get get some get some of that uh, uh, combination strip uh, letter set that I sent to you. So. <laughs> Thank you.